So when we look at the Phillips curve, then it feels like there's a trade-off between inflation and unemployment, right? We could decide to have really low inflation, uh, which would require higher unemployment, or we could decide to have lower unemployment with some higher inflation. And so we can think about this as, um, you know, with the policymakers, the central bank, sort of trading off higher inflation for lower unemployment, where we might have a best outcome here, say at point F, where we have full employment and 2% inflation. And most central banks do prefer to have a low but positive level of inflation, like 2% rather than 0%, in order to avoid the costly effects of deflation. And then their preferences, their indifference curves, kind of circle out a little bit like a bullseye, right? They don't go past full employment because uh, that doesn't make any sense. Um, and then the feasible set is the Phillips curve, right? We can sort of choose where on the Phillips curve we want by choosing whichever uh, is on basically the highest indifference curve, right? Where we'd like to be at point F, but that's not feasible because of the Phillips curve and the bargaining gap. Um, but we could be at point C, right, where we have 3% unemployment and 5% inflation, um, as opposed to, say, being here, where we have 6% unemployment uh, and 0% inflation, right? And so that is how the central banks, uh, especially the Federal Reserve, kind of thought about this trade-off in the 1960s uh, and even into the 1970s. So if we think about this, we have these indifference curves, right, where we have this optimal level uh, here, and uh, policymakers are willing to trade off uh, some level of inflation for unemployment. So when inflation is high, they're willing to accept, you know, more unemployment in order to get rid of it. As inflation gets lower, they're less willing to accept higher unemployment, right? So when they're here, uh, you know, inflation is low, they don't really want any less inflation, and so all they want is lower unemployment. Um, this is the labor supply, and this would be our best outcome, right, where everybody is working, everybody has a job, and we have low but steady inflation. Um, as we said in the last graph, we can't always get there, right? We can't get there because of the Phillips curve. If we were at point F, the bargaining gap would be too high, and we would end up with higher inflation. Um, and at this point of higher inflation, we'd be willing to trade off some uh, of the unemployment. So point C might be our optimal outcome, right, where the Phillips curve is just tangent to the policymakers' preferences. Um, unfortunately, the Phillips curve kind of disappeared. So if we look at the Phillips curve by decade uh, in the United States, we see that it has shifted fairly substantially and kind of broke down uh, in the 70s and 80s. So here in the light blue is the Phillips curve in the 1960s. It's pretty tight. The R squared would be pretty high. Uh, in the early 70s, it looks like it shifted to the left. Uh, inflation went up, and there's a number of reasons for that we'll talk about. Um, and then in the late 70s, it shifted even more so to the green color, and it became you know less stable. And by the early 80s, it had really looks like it had fallen apart, right? We had very little relationship between inflation and unemployment. Um, as inflation came down in the 80s, uh, by the early 90s, we had a more stable relationship, right? Um, and by the late 2000s and early 90s, we had this sort of uh, yellow uh, Phillips curve, um, which was flatter than it had been in the 60s, uh, but at least the points were more uh, open. Um, and so the argument here is that we can't really trade off unemployment for inflation, that there's really only one unemployment rate at which inflation is stable, right? That's that point B that we had in our labor market diagram uh, where we're at equilibrium in the labor market. And what we sort of learned in the 1960s and 1970s was the importance of expected inflation. So if firms and workers are expecting a certain level of inflation, then they build that into their uh, wage demands and into their price setting decision so that if they expect 5% inflation, then prices and wages increase by 5% almost automatically, right? And so inflation ends up being equal to expected inflation, 
plus whatever the difference is in the bargaining gap, right? So if we expect 5% inflation and we have a 2% bargaining gap because of uh, the expansion in the economy, we actually end up with 7% inflation. Uh, and so that's really why the uh, unemployment rate inflation uh, relationship in the Phillips curve fell apart in the 1970s was because expected inflation was increasing. Inflation had been low in the 50s, but increased in the 60s. People started to build that expected inflation into their wage demands and pricing decisions, and the Phillips curve uh, kind of fell apart. So as long as the bargaining gap remains unchanged, um, as long as we try to be at a place below that uh, in stable inflation point, then inflation increases each year. And so we can kind of walk through that. You know, if we have a 2% bargaining gap because inflation, uh, inflation is, let's say, 3%, then that 2% bargaining gap will push inflation up to 5%. And now people expect inflation to be 5%. And if we have a 2% bargaining gap still, now inflation will be 2% plus 5% or 7%. And that will just keep going and going. And this is really what was happening sort of uh, in the 1970s, inflation got higher and higher and higher until it topped out at about 14% in 1980. And the Fed just sort of figured this out and realized that they had to bring expected inflation down.